Tatsuki Fujimoto is my favorite kind of artist. Oh. Watching a petrol coffee. Eight police officers in Edinburgh have been injured in bomb fire night disorder. Tatsuki Fujimoto is the most interesting artist working in comics. Not just manga, the whole thing, internationally. Nobody in any scene anywhere right now is doing shit like him right now. Except maybe this guy, but y'all not ready for that conversation. The dude is a weirdo whose entire body of work seems to be built off eliciting the twin phrases you know what be fucked up and this shit hard. His stuff is not only good but it's good in a way that I find compelling spiritually. Whenever I look at some of my favorite mangaka's work, your Takeuko Inoue's, your Kentaro Miura or Tayo Matsumoto's, it often feels a bit overwhelming as if it wasn't made by mere human hands. As an art moment it's humbling because looking at a page of Vagabond or Berserker number 5, I find that the skill necessary to do this is so vastly above anything I can even begin to imagine. I am both awestruck and humbled in its presence. It's what I imagine Musashi felt like when he got pump faked by that old guy in his sleep. I would not be pressed if Takeko Inoue never drew a single page of Vagabond again. The fact that I'm able to witness this story up to this point is an honor I refuse to take for granted. Fujimoto's work is a bit different though. As an artist, he's interesting to me because he's not operating on this deific level these guys are. His work has noticeable flaws, his poses are awkward and stiff, his action is often extremely truncated, and his faces have that Hajime Isayama expression problem. It's not that bad, but you get where I'm coming from. The stiffness in his art paired with his incredible taste make for some remarkable stuff. Fire Punch is so good, man. Fujimoto does not make immaculate art because of his drawing abilities, he does it despite them. That's not to say he's a bad artist though, far from it. The man has an eye for design that you simply cannot teach. Conventional character design wisdom airs somewhere on there. Your characters should tell a story, everything about them should serve to build a memorable character, and then Fujimoto just has a raw concept and puts that shit on paper, unrefined, undiluted. I think back to this Yuji Kaku interview from three years ago. Uh, Yuji Kaku is Fujimoto's former assistant and the guy who made Jigokuraku and Ayashimon. It's really good, you should read it. In it, he describes how Fujimoto's design practices differ from the average mangaka. If Fujimoto sensei and I were to draw the same subject, I would think about how to convey my favorite aspect in the most uncomplicated way, resulting in the addition of detail. However, Fujimoto-sensei would simply draw out his favorite things just as it is. Sometimes when I see this, I'll think, is this going to be alright? But it's accepted by the readers. Therefore, the devils of Chainsaw Man are not so surprising in terms of design. There isn't much surprise in the design itself and gives the feelings of, that's exactly how I imagine it to be. This is what I've been waiting for. Nevertheless, there is a bit of shock in the fact that it's presented as is. It takes a lot of courage to do that, right? He has the momentum to just step on the accelerator saying go to something that others would feel anxious doing. That's right. Even with food where the ingredients are presented uncooked, you try to arrange the plate nicely or at least give an explanation that the ingredients are purposely left as they are. But Fujimoto-sensei doesn't do this. I really admire him for that. Even with post-transformation Denji's design, usually you'd think to add a bit more. The fact that he's got the handle as his head is a very Fujimoto-sensei thing to design. Normally when designing a monster with a chainsaw, you'd focus on the blades. But in the case of Fujimoto-sensei, the tool itself is propped on to be the head. Also, the difference in design between Fujimoto-sensei and me is the way he incorporates elements of comedy into his designs. When I design, I will always stick to what I think is cool, and that's my weakness. Fujimoto-sensei's designs will include my favorite aspects of design, but also a large amount of comedy in it. This can also be applied to the story. That's what I really look up to. The man is built in an atypical fashion. I mean, look at this Captain America. This shit looks like it came straight out of Warhammer. This is a natural evolution of America as depicted in Chainsaw Man, as an empire built by death worshippers. An altar whose entire population has been placed upon as a sacrifice for the gods of the SNP 500. That Israel is able to defend itself, including from Iran and Iran back militias. Fujimoto is also very funny. So much of his work to me reads like a judgment-free exploration of what a nigga like me might find amusing. The way Denji sees power initially as a literal pair of tits and the payoff being that they were fake is just it's it's peak. Peak. His characters are often crass and brutal and just utterly hopeless. The grim humor of his work is sold both by his stilted characters and his incredibly rendered gore, which looks, he, it looks so good because he draws it in such hard shadows under black sprays of blood. His violence is stylized in the same way that Tarantino's is, and most of that good shit wouldn't come out if he just wrote it and abdicated the drawing to a more conventionally skilled mangaka. It's the same as Attack on Titan in that sense, like I mentioned earlier. Hajime Sayama couldn't draw a three-quarter angle face to save his life, but those weird stiff 
faces do wonders when he's trying to express fear or when he exaggerates them in his depictions of the titans. They are kindred spirits in that way, two men forced into greatness by the limits of their ability to express themselves. Art that isn't great doesn't always mean you're gonna fall short of your goal as an artist. It's just another limitation in the art making process and limitations are one of the most important aspects of making art. Around the time Fujimoto was publishing Fire Punch, he sat down to do one of those magazine manga interviews with the author behind Blade of the Immortal and actual god hand Hiroaki Samura. Most of this interview is Samura being old and Fujimoto just molding at how much better of an artist he is. He asks him multiple times in different ways how he's so good at drawing, how he achieves a certain effect in his manga and the answer is always, I don't know, I thought it looked good. Both of them talk inspiration from other mangaka and the struggles of being serialized and what kind of toll it takes on you. The moment that really sticks out to me in this interview is when Fujimoto says whenever he sees someone who's really good at drawing, like really good, there's a pang of bitterness in him because he feels like there's a secret that they inherited that he hasn't been let in on. When I see a good artist, it makes me think that they must be cheating somehow. Like they got to redo their life or something, or else it wouldn't be possible to achieve that level of skill. There are a few people I think of like that and you're number one. Another one is Kim jung gi sensei. I feel like they all must have sacrificed something in their lives to get more time to draw. It's really interesting that the example he uses here is Kim jung gi which, like, yeah, that, that dude is different. There will never be another Kim jung gi But in the wake of greatness, we are all still left with stories to tell and the drive to make them. Kendrick Lamar has like five songs about this. Our limits frame our subjective experience and our art can only exist under those two things. Even Takeuka Inoue, god hand he may be, still had terrible days. Look Back is a semi-autobiographical short about Fujimoto's existence as an artist. We follow a middle schooler named Fujino who enjoys the gratification of being the most skilled artist in her school. Her comic strips in the school newspaper are the best art anyone in her year has seen from an age mate, until a younger student who doesn't really come to school starts publishing alongside her. People are so impressed by how much better she is than Fujino that it spurs Fujino to strive to get better. She even does the dreaded how to draw good Google search. That shit defined my life from ages 12 to 18. But no matter how good she gets, she's never good enough. The true Aunt Kiyomoto is still drawing laps around her. Fujino persists until the 6th grade and then just drops the manga thing entirely. When she gets to finally meet Kiyomoto, she's struck first by the sheer amount of sketchbooks outside her door. She really does this shit. And after getting her to come out of her room, this happens. There's levels to this shit. My readings are surface level and the cool media literate YouTube guys are making fun of me in private group chats. So much of what I get reading look back is this guttural feeling of that's real as fuck. But my singular art struggles are not why we're here. The thing that stood out to me about this story is that these characters are both Fujimoto. Like literally. Fujino's art in the comic strips looks one for one like Fujimoto's early one day draft one shots he would blast out when he was submitting manuscripts daily in his early 20s and late teens. And the better art is him as of now. It's not only a man frustrated with his limitation, seething over others who are much better at this than he is currently, it's him in conversation with his former less skilled self. The only thing Fujino can focus on is how much better Kiyomoto is than her and in that she ignores how much better she's gotten in the process of trying to improve. And the moment she's faced with the fact that she's her biggest inspiration, it frees her from this prison of ooh I hate this nigga bro, he not even that good, how the fuck did he do that? She walks home and instinctively starts dancing. It's also not lost on me that this moment of Fujino's artistic liberation is one of Fujimoto's best drawings ever. There's levels to this shit. Present day. <laughs> Present time. <laughs> Lane is a psychological thriller about a girl who goes on the computer and then discovers that we are all connected. Everything is everything. Mackenzie works, game space, cyberspace, dichotomy is biblical text, and death is not the end. But before she can become the ghost in everybody's machine, she starts out lonely and isolated. This finds expression in the show through. A lot of awkward pauses and strange alien-like conversation. Listening to Lane's parents try to talk to her feels wrong, like these people have no attachment to this child, which you later learn that they don't. Every adult she interacts with is uncannily rotoscoped and her interactions with the world around her make it feel like she exists entirely outside of it. Traditional backgrounds are sparse and what replaces them are these dreamlike shadows cutting against the pure white void, devoid of anything but her and other people, all of whom are small and fading into the distance. These creative choices built into Lane's atmosphere and its themes and all of them are built off triangle staff working on a shoestring budget. If you were to remake this show with infinite money, it would probably be worse because the circumstances Abe and Ko had to work under forced them to make these creative decisions. Decisions that would have not come to them naturally if they had regular background and proper animation money. These limitations inform the nature of the art. Removing them won't necessarily make a better final product. Case in point. What's wrong with these niggas? Sandshakers looks like shit. 
In fact, I'm gonna get even more annoying about this. The act of creating art itself is built upon limitations. To condense down your imagination, your abilities of perception in 3D space to a two-dimensional plane with any degree of recognizability demands you omit some information. Perspective is informed as much by what you don't see as much as what you can. I cannot speak for abstract work for I'm neither experienced nor good in the subject, but for the shit I have done, limitations are everything, man. Just because your timeline has 24 frames doesn't mean you're gonna use all of it. Most of the time, I am not a very good animator as evidenced here. Some movements just hit better if you cut up some of the information. Painters choose how to direct your eye by sparing detail in less important areas or just placing details in a manner that's so sparse but is cohesive in the whole. Even philosophically, as an artist, to make anything at all is to build in limitations. Perfection doesn't exist and anyone who's ever tried to tirelessly chase it has never finished anything because it isn't perfect. The art can only exist once you pull it from your perfect ever-expanding imagination and extrude it through your flawed flesh, death-prone physical body that makes it real and allows other people to interact with it. I'm not interested in the version of Chainsaw Man in Tatsuki Fujimoto's head, even though to him, in his mind's eye, it's probably better than anything he could put down on paper. But the fact that he put it onto paper makes it real. It suffuses it with his flaws and awkward anatomy and jokes in the backgrounds of pages and Denji's fucked up loaf sneakers and that's my shit. That's the thing that me and millions of other people love. It's in his unabashed love for cinema and manga that endures despite his suicide ideation inducing work schedule that then inspires his composition and writing. Writing that could only come from a man this... this strange. That love and creativity devoid of judgement being put into strenuous practice makes all of his work feel precious and special, like I'm peeking at the dark unseemly insides of a man's mind. Shout out to his editor who gave him boxes of DVDs and manga to read when he started submitting one shots, he's th the real hero here. He saw this socially maladapted 17 year old with some creativity in him and immediately knew that he needed to put him in front of as much art as possible, really refine his insanity. It's probably why whenever anybody asks him for advice about how to become a mangaka, he replies with get Netflix. Fujimoto being so pop culture pilt makes the creative choices in Chainsaw Man seem crazier to me somehow. I can draw a straight line from Giga Kutami's love of manga and movies and trace it through Yuji's movie binge training to his relationship with Junpei and the animal he becomes in the end. It's clean, it makes sense. But a Texas Chainsaw Massacre love letter being published in a children's magazine perplexes me to no end. Thematically it's a very 16 year old catered story but also fuck dude, I can't imagine something like this getting made where I live, like anybody who's ever had to sit through the Broadcast Complaints Commission of South Africa can attest how stringent that shit is. It makes me respect the man even more. In the incredibly hostile manga market, he moves to the beat of his own drum. Nothing in this motherfucker's work is market tested. It makes flipping through those pages feel all the more meaningful, knowing that this dude is following his skits or artistic sensibilities and moving beautifully regardless of what market trends may indicate. Also, I can't help but approve of a man who's brave enough to put his sexual fixations in his work like this. I wonder what that dude's DVD shelf looks like. I bet it's crazy in there. The hedonic treadmill is endless and the feeling of not being good enough will chase you until you die. Denji lives a life of the lowest of the have-nots. He dreams of eating more than one slice of bread as a meal and feeling the warmth of some double D's. I've seen a lot of people groan at this moment and the ass chasing he does as a result of this but the nigga is a teenager bro. There's a real tragedy in the fact that this nigga was so poor that the concept of even being with another person was not a possibility in his future. I feel like there's a knee-jerk revulsion from otherwise sexually progressive people whenever it's a guy expressing his sexual urge and I, I get why that is. Societal forces have made that a terrifying thing to women because it could be and very often is something to be afraid of. But sometimes a nigga is just horny and broke. Two horrible things to be at the same time, let me tell you. When I first came across this manga three years ago on completely legitimate and legal website, this was the moment I knew that I was going to read this manga to the end. And now as a freshly single dude who got kobe out of what I thought was a loving relationship with a human resources ass 10 word phrase, I, I gotta say man, the prospect of being desired by someone sounds really nice about now. My desire for sexual and emotional gratification is a deferred desire for a complete understanding by a woman who I can in turn understand completely. And without shame or ego or the need to fall into what it means to be a man or a woman or anything to anyone except that person and in turn to myself. Remember the essays that we wrote in elementary school? I wrote that I wanted to be an actress, a singer or a model when I grow up. I think I want lots of people to know who I was. But that's not true anymore. Now I just want one. I want one person who knows me from the top of my head to the tips of my toes without a millimeter of misunderstanding. I want the perfect comprehension. I don't want anything else if I can just be with that person. If that dream came true, 
I'd be okay dying right then and there. I wanna touch some boobs. Fujino did find someone though. She and Kiyomoto spend their time reading and writing manga together, one the principal mangaka and the other the assistant. In this time, Kiyomoto learns to become more herself and steps out of her shell and even starts wanting to better herself, away from the person who has been her emotional and social crutch since they were kids, and in that pursuit, she's caught up in an attack on her art school which she does not survive. There is no friendship without the possibility that one will die before the other, perhaps right before their eyes. For even when friends die together, or rather at the same time, their friendship will have been structured by the possibility that one of them would see the other die. And so surviving would be left to bury, to commemorate and to mourn. So to live with love is to put in yourself in a position to be hurt. And it hurts real bad, man. It struck me while I was writing that boob section earlier that Denji has never been loved. His daddy killed himself, these niggas damn sure didn't love him and Makima isn't capable of love. I think the only people who ever loved this nigga are Power and Aki and we both know how those ended. Also, his mom died of cancer? Holy shit! Fujimoto is one of my favorite artists because he put his work out even when he didn't particularly think high of it. And I and others were able to find it and love it. The Vertical World got on the Shonen Jump website by the sheer weight of Kutanaka's writing. His art being the caliber of tales gets trolled it did not stop him. It helped him stand out in front of a panel of judges and an ocean of vastly more talented artists. The art wants to exist, it will eat your soul if you don't let it come out of you. The thing that distinguishes the artist from the one day I'm gonna make the stingers is the fact that the artist just did it. If your heart desires to make art, make it. Do it consistently and without drama. Put enough of yourself out there and eventually someone will find it and see some part of themselves in it. That's what I get when I open Fujimoto's manga and that's why he's one of my favorites. Uh, thank you for your time. If you thought this was good and want more, uh, like and subscribe. I need to learn how to say this without sounding awkward, man. But yeah, thank you.